So, first of all, I would like to apologize that I will not be speaking in German, so it is going to be an English uh, language presentation. Uh, I do speak German, I do understand German, but it would sound literally as if I'm chewing buttons and you do not want to listen to that. It's a <laughs> catastrophe. So, uh, I would also like to give you a little bit more information about myself. So, at the moment, I, as uh, Sergei has nicely said, I'm actually kind of working between Dusseldorf, Frankfurt and uh, Zurich. Um, my actually uh, central is in uh, Frankfurt where I belong to the International Competence Center. Why is that I think important? Um, what uh, is actually happening at the moment with advertising is that there are so many changes that we cannot actually keep track in a way that we used to um, years ago, even like three years ago. So what we are at the moment trying to do in Mindshare Germany, especially in, in, in Frankfurt, is actually to set up a competence center. Because even if you're talking about uh, strategies, so strategy, strategy is no longer a media strategy. You have data strategies, you have communication strategies, you have communication design, you have target audience strategies. So they are really require a lot of different sets of ex expertise, so a lot of different sets of competences. And we want to make sure that all the clients have the best access to those competences to one center, which is actually at the moment in Frankfurt, but as you can see, we are very mobile and moving around. And uh, on the other hand side, I would really like to thank Sadie because uh, work, working in Switzerland, especially on Swiss client, has actually helped me a little bit put the context, uh, put the entire, uh, let's say, uh, business nowadays and the challenges that we have across not only in Germany and not only across DAC but also in context and to see how we can actually come up with the solutions that are relevant, that are adaptive, that are fast for our clients. So today's presentation is going to be a little bit, I would say, a thought starter. Maybe some of the things are going to be a little bit a challenge. In a sense, I really want to be a little bit provocative. Uh, why? So my background is also, I do a lot of academia uh, work. So my background, I have a PhD degree in media studies, but it comes a little bit from the perspective of uh, cultural studies, so media and culture, the studies of popular culture, film, and so on and so on. So there is actually a really, really big overlap between culture and advertising. Actually, advertising, believe it or not, and this is what I have found out from my research, is that at the moment, advertising is key mover of the cultural discourses uh, basically worldwide. So let's say 10, 20 years ago, that used to be art. Art was the one who was setting, let's say, cultural agendas. Nowadays, that's advertising. So this is something where basically the perspective that we are going to start from and what we want to, what I will actually try to do is to put things in context, make a little bit of a step back so that we understand that even though the changes are really, really happening fast, even though there are um, technology is allowing us to do things that we haven't been able to do before. There is still something really deeply human and there is still something really deeply meaningful that we need to kind of set a foot on and make sure that, um, that, that we have a plan and that we have a strategy behind how we could communicate and what we convey. So as Xavier has already stated, this is basically the topic of, um, of the today's presentation. It, but I want to worry there will be no plenty of charts or graphics or numbers and so on. It is going to be a story to try to kind of make us think and make us and hopefully inspire you guys to think how we can kind of drive our communication, albeit brand communication or um, communications in terms of topics for publishers uh, further. So, just a second. Yes. So I would like to go back to uh, one of the first textbooks that I have read during my, um, during my postgrad studies, and that was the, the, the book written by a French author called, called, his name was Guy Debord. It was written very, very, I think in the seventh decade of the 20th century, so in 1963 or something, and it is called The Society of Spectacle. Why am I saying, uh, and why I want to actually name uh, this book here now? Because we do live in a society of spectacle. And uh, what does that actually mean? It means that we are pursuing technology for the technology's sake, just for, the, just for the sake of showing that we can do something and that we are rushing into using the technology whenever it is available to us, 
not necessarily because we have a pragmatical reason to it, not necessarily because we know what we want to do it, but rather just because it is available. So this is the danger that we, that we are nowadays fa facing, and I think most of you are involved and are reading about artificial intelligences. We will get to that place very, very soon when artificial intelligence will be possible as a technology, and there is a danger that we will make that step just because we can, without actually thinking things through adequately. So this is the thing that is actually happening a little bit uh, with media and advertising as well. So all the technology, the research data, the um, uh, possibilities that are offered to us with, let's say, for example, dynamic uh, creative, um, uh, creative optimization, so different creatives, real-time advertising, and so on and so on, they have all come to be very quickly driven by the fact that it is available to us, that the technology is available to us before we actually had the time to completely take a step back and understand what that means to us, where it is guiding us to, what the data that we have available, so boxes and boxes of data, how it can, how it can be used. So we are basically at the moment, and I think most of you know that, just collecting and collecting because the technology is allowing us to, but we do not really have the adequate solution how to uh, what to do with it, what is the meaning of all this data that we have in our hands, or also the other technologies in terms of um, creative, uh, real-time, for example, outdoor advertising or uh, programmatic advertising with uh, really, really tailor-made, precise targeting. It is for us available, but we still really do not know how and where to, where does it lead. So that's what I'm saying also. So in a society of spectacle, advertising and media have also become a spectacle on their own. So that means we, means we need to take a little bit of a step back. One good example that I usually um, give when I, when I say that we live in a society of spectacle where media are also uh, a spectacle on their own and also the advertising is uh, cinema. So basically if you take a look at the last, I think it is more or less 15 years, what are the top performing box office cinema titles you can see that basically there is absolutely no grand narratives there. Those are Transformers, those are Avengers, those are, I don't know, it's a very, very big number of um, sequels. So basically, the most successful titles in box office are the ones that are pushing the technology further. 3D, 4D, smell, hear, feel, and so on and so on, whereas the actual meaning and the actual story has been almost cast away. And the interesting thing is that there is a very um, clear differentiation when that happened. That it actually happened with the, uh, with the Lord of the Rings tra trilogy, where basically that was the last big narrative that actually had a really, really big cinema, a cinema success that also pushed the technology further. After that, basically, um, the technology took over. So another thing that I think we need to really have in mind, and sometimes we do forget, is that when we are doing advertising, when we are communicating um, our information about our products, we are not just advertising has made a really big step from only communicating the uh, practical need. So you have a product, you have a toothpaste, you will say that there is a toothpaste, someone will buy a toothpaste, they will have a healthy teeth. That does work like that. But it is also satisfying emotional need. We really advertising no longer, you know how much Actually, when you are most probably, especially the, the, the clients here, here or basically the, 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 the companies, when you are thinking about your creatives, about how you want to communicate, you're actually already interpreting what this color will mean, what, is, what it will, what will mean if we take this kind of person in our ad or that kind of person. We call it in our, in our let's say, theory, basically a discursive analysis. You're already doing a discursive analysis. It is no longer just telling there is a toothpaste there or there is a car that can get you from A to B. It is more what this automobile can do for you emotionally. So in that regards, advertising sets cultural agendas. So it is very important, we need to understand that we have a very, very responsible job because we are setting the desires, we are setting the cultural conversation, we are setting the trends. So that means that we are basically driving almost the entire culture forward. As I said, even according to the research, more than art. So advertising is the kind of moving and key cultural driving force in the world. But on the other hand, this is actually a very, I think, interesting uh, piece of information uh, from a research from last year. 
So if you would ask people nowadays, most of them would say that they couldn't care less if 74% of the brands just disappeared from the face of the earth. So there's no relevance for them. They're using them most probably today because they're satisfying their, some, their pragmatic need or something that um, they um, simply need to have. You need to have your toothpaste, you need to have your toilet paper, you need to have um, also uh, milk and, uh, and, and also chocolate and so on. But they can disappear. If they disappear tomorrow, today, people would not care. But even though this number is actually quite, quite big, I would even say that this 26% that the people really care about is also big. So 26% of the brands, people really say, if they disappear tomorrow, I would really hurt. If they disappear tomorrow, I would really, really miss them. Not because I will not have an alternative in my daily life. It is more because it is satisfying a certain emotional need that I have. It is, I'm connected to it, I like to have it in my life, and this is the brand that I kind of rely on. So then we come to the question, what is the secret behind this 26%? Those 26% of the brands are, we call basically iconic brands. So the brands that are either like have a, a, a level of a star or an icon. I have shown here basically three examples, just so that you have a little bit of the idea. And what is actually the key, uh, these are basically the three things that make iconic brands iconic brands. So first of all, they are instantly recognizable. You don't necessarily need to have written below Apple so that you know that this uh, logo stands for Apple or for example on the right hand side that it is the Unilever Stuff product. So the first thing is that they instantly come to mind. And one of the reasons how they are able to come to mind is first of all because they have defined their role in culture. The interesting thing about these brands is that they did not start with the product. They did not say, okay, I have developed this iPod or I have developed a car and I'm going to see right now how I'm going to market it and whom I'm going to market it. They have started with defining a cultural territory. They have started by saying, I'm a brand, I want to say something really, really important and this is how I'm going to say it. And the basically product is just a proof of that. It's basically proof of what I stand for, what my beliefs are, and what kind of, let's say, cultural attentions or cult cultural needs I am responding to. And that's why they end up with this third thing. They're very worthy of admiration. That's why they are long-standing, they're surviving, because they do have the cultural agenda, cultural conversations that they are driving, that they are pushing, and um, not only, of course, today, not only tomorrow, but they have a plan how to do that um, in the long run. So bottom line, it comes to the cultural relevance. So bottom line, it is basically cultural relevance, making sure that you know at what, your brand, what your brand's battles are and where you're fighting them and why you are fighting them for. And one of the most interesting thing is also how then the definition of branding has evolved in regards to this. So the old, let's say, the old-fashioned definition of branding used to be the mar that it was the marketing practice of creating a name, symbol, or design that identifies and differentiates a product from, uh, from other products. So the interesting thing here is that basically the point was so that within the same industry, where of course you are fighting for your position, where the same, where basically um, different brands, different products are fighting for their, uh, for their position and for their market share and for sales and so on. The key point was being different, but being different from other brands, being different from the competition. Nowadays, the definition says, branding is a set of techniques designed to generate cultural relevance. So it is no longer, I want to be different, it is no longer Mazda, I want to be different from Volvo, it is now, I want to be different because I stand for my values. I stand for this, um, this uh, values in the, in, in the culture. I stand for the fact that the driver will always have a role in the process of driving, even when the self-driving cars come to, um, come to life and come to terms. So basically, self-driving cars are again one of the, let's say, technology spectacles. We are significantly further in terms of communicating them and talking about them because the technology allows it, then we are actually envisioning how it will all work. 
So another very important thing about uh, setting cultural agendas, and that basically is the core of cultural branding, is it is not easy. So that is a very important thing. So one thing that we have, um, I think, gotten used to is that with advertising we pursue positive agendas. We want to pursue positive emotions. As you know, most probably, and for me it is always funny to see, like, especially on this kind of TV shop commercials, where people are doing on this really, really difficult exercises and you see that they are really sweating and the, the, the voiceover says, oh look, it is so easy, they are smiling, you can do it in your home, or you can do it like when you have like five minutes of spare time and you really can see that the, 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 the lady is suffering there but she you know, keeps her mouth like this, like in, a, in a almost um, like a facial, facial, a facial expression that tells that she's happy. So advertising, and that, that is fine because that was the way uh, that was kind of the tradition of old advertising before we went through the evolution because as the, uh, the advertising practices evolve also the audiences who are able to interpret it interpret those um, advertising practices evolve and they are able to recognize them so that is another thing people right now know what an ad is and they know what to expect from an ad and they know that it is a little bit of exaggerated beautified um, purified uh, message that doesn't necessarily it that doesn't necessarily hold kind of 100% truth. But when you want to communicate to the audiences in different ways, in, especially with content, they expect you to be more genuine. So that's why I'm saying it is about starting and leading difficult conversations. What does that mean? I will give you the example of Unilever and Duff. It was not easy saying that wrinkled or grey is beautiful. So there was a big anxiety, as you most probably know, like almost a decade ago, if, if, if not even more, about how spectacle of media, how spectacle of advertising has created an image of a perfect body, especially perfect female body. So there was a huge anxiety between, especially female target audience, about how am I going to live up to those expectations? How am I going to live up to this photoshopped, perfect bodies, perfect skin, perfect hair, perfect everything perfect. That was basically the spectacle that was being presented, but that has generated anxiety. And this is one of the things that happens with the spectacle. Usually the, uh, the anxiety happens. And Unilever was brave enough to pick up this conversation. It was not a smiling conversation. It was not a conversation where everything is perfect, in order, where everything is uh, just working smoothly and we are resolving with advertising all the problems. No, it was just showing the things, showing the images of wrinkled or grey women that were almost unimaginable back then in advertising and saying, this is beautiful, this is real, this is real beauty. Another example is Mac, so basically Apple. The thing is, uh, in 1984, when actually the first um, personal computer was launched, there was a huge anxiety with technology. So saying that technology is simple was not an easy task. I can tell you that like in 50s and 60s, when the first uh, computers appeared, they were really like Kaniac and things like that. They were filling the entire rooms. There was really, like similarly like with artificial intelligence, you can really uh, make, a, make a parallel there. So uh, the way that we are scared of artificial intelligence a little bit now, so the anxiety that we are having is the similar anxiety that, was in, uh, that existed in, in the 80s with uh, the advent of the computers. People were again asking whether they are going to take, our, take on our world. There was always this kind of man-machine dialogue and man-machine man anxiety. And then Apple came and said, okay, we need to resolve this anxiety. We need to resolve this and show that actually technology works in our favor and technology can be simple and technology can serve us. And from there, they have actually developed a whole range of products, they still develop a whole range of products, showing us basically how simple, how beautiful, how acceptable that is. The third example is actually an example that I myself am not quite clear yet, because this is the brand that actually grew instantly, almost overnight, and has made maybe one of the boldest, most daring statements ever. So that also most probably has to do some, a little bit with Elon Musk and his own huge ego. But the thing is, 
that he dare to say there is life beyond. That is a huge statement. That is like, I think, maybe the bravest statement ever. So he is not actually making cars. It is not, we always say, okay, Tesla is car making company. And sometimes I have to say that, especially in the discussions when we are, when it is discussed whether Tesla is making profit or not making profit, let's like move that aside because, as I said, I'm myself, I'm not 100% clear whether this brand is going to survive the way it is right now, but this is how it is set up. So it is not about making a profit on selling a Model 3. It is not about uh, really building a car. It is showing that there is life beyond resources that are available to us at this moment. There are other resources out there. It is about you know using 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 building multiple user rockets. It is about saying that we can make a colony on the moon. It is about saying that there is possibility to make batteries that can, you know, kind of a, um, uh, exchange and that can replace the unsustainable um, resources that are um, that are that are disappearing. It is about making a hyperloop and saying that we can make a really really fast um, fast journey without actually uh, being dangerous for our environment. So it is a very very bold statement. It is saying that my cultural position is telling to the people that there is hope, that the resources that we have, yes, are limited, but we as a humanity have our um, possibilities and can make it, can basically change this and we'll always find the life beyond. So that is what cultural branding is basically about. It is about the identifying the territory of big cultural anxiety. So, for example, I can. I always. I'm sorry that I'm always going back to Mazda a little bit because this is the uh, the brand that I used to work uh, work on. Uh, it is Mazda did this really nice thing, recognizing precisely in the era where everyone was so inspired with technology and everyone was so um, rushing to show how they are first into um, autonomous driving, how they will send. The, 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 even the car to the moon and things like that, that's all technological spectacle. Whereas in the communication, Mazda went and said, no, there is a pleasure in driving and you know that there are so many of us who like to drive and have this anxiety and question, what is going to happen with my joy of driving once there are autonomous cars? And then you dip into this territory and drive those sorts of conversations. So that means basically what I wanted to say is that cultural branded is not branded content. So this is really important difference to make. Because with branded content, this is something you will most probably say, okay, so I'm working with the culture, or for example, I know I dip into the music territory, I've dipped into the film territory, I sponsor this film festival, I sponsor this music festival, or I'm collaborating with this artist on making, um, on, um, making a, a show together. Yes, that is very important, that is dipping into, so to say, the, the creative conversations, but it is really not making a significant culture, cultural footstep, because there you are just kind of following the trend of, let's say, entertainment standard communi communication, whereas you are not really dipping into the anxieties and you are not driving the conversation yourself. So there is actually one campaign that was launched very recently and I would like really to show um, an example to you. Uh, even though unfortunately it hasn't been done by my share, so I apologize straight away. <laughs> the fact is that it is really so, um, shows so nicely how actually cultural branding is not reserved only for the Apples and, um, and Teslas of this world. Every brand has a place. Why? Because every brand has its own mission, vision, and role in culture. You just need to kind of find this conversation and kind of bring, bring it upwards. So I will try to play this video. I hope it will work. In 160 seconds, you will decide how the story ends. Oh. Sorry. This is a story about us. generation that spends 90% of its life indoors. 
It all started the day we left nature behind. We filled our homes with lovely things and all the stuff we wanted. Our home became places we would never want to leave. Artificial light replaced daylight. And we built our houses so that nothing could escape. We cooked and showered, we ate and played, slept and sweated. But we had closed ourselves in. To a point where nothing could get out. content, you cannot call it the ad, you cannot call it the um, um, TV ad or even cinema ad, you cannot even call it a social media piece of content. So this is basically what the, the, what the big difference is. And the interesting thing, as you've seen, most, most probably there was no brand whatsoever until the very end where there was a statement that it was actually the film done by Felix, the company that actually produces Windows. So it's not a Tesla, it's not a Apple, it's not even... Um, um, I don't know, Dove or, or Coca-Cola, it's a company that has realized that it has, that there are problems in our society that it can address and offer solutions to and has, made, has done that in a very, very responsible way. Because this is not a happy ad. You have most probably seen it. Most of the ad is very dark. Most of the, the content is actually, I'm sorry, I should not refer to it as an ad. Uh, most of the content is actually very dark. It is stressing very seriously the issues that, uh, that exist, literally one by one. Very concrete about asthma, about air pollution, about allergies. And if you go to the website later on, there are actually sections that address each and every of those issues individually. So they are setting, so, and also Perox has basically invested into research into this area to make sure that it is kind of doing things for the better and positioning themselves as leader in this communication. So the next time someone actually tries to understand a little bit about how living indoors is changing us in terms of our position of the body or allergies and so on, they will also go back and refer to, uh, to research done by virus. Another thing which is very interesting about this clip and I found really inspiring is, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed in the very middle, there is the part where almost all advertising 
cliches are disrupted. There is a girl sitting on a toilet seat presented. There is a small, very, very short clip of sex there. There is um, also someone actually passing the gases, a sweaty guy, then also someone like eating really, really messily. So those are all the things that were like a no-no for advertising. Like we do not want to show a body that is not perfect. We do not want to show things that are sort of say indecent and so on. Here, no, they basically addressed all of it and said, okay, we need to be real, we need to get real and understand what, what we are standing for, uh, what the issues are that we can actually address and help there. Another thing which I find that drives us to the, to the next um, important topic, what I find really, really interesting is there is a lot of, you can, you can see there is, although I think it was launched maybe three weeks ago, the ad, and there is already like um, a piece of content. 8 million views, and there are many, many comments. But why have I actually um, made a screenshot of those? So it resonates, because here, for example, you can, you can read one thing where it says like, yes, as an autistic male living alone, who has only left the house a few times in the last five or so years, the message is particularly relevant to me. So this is the kind of thing that most probably the, uh, the guys from Velux did not anticipate. This is most probably not the audiences that they wanted to go for. So then there comes a really, really important question when we say everything starts with an audience. Yes, but does it always and in a way we want it to? So the thing that uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit, and this is also based on the experience that I had working on many, many campaigns in the last, especially the last several years, again going back a little bit to the spectacle of the data and the spectacle of the um, and the data analytics in terms of target audiences especially. It is, we somehow, because of course, especially in our communication, we want our communication to be happy, we want our brands to be impactful, we want, want our brands to be cool. No one wants their brand to be appealing for, or most of us do not want them to be kind of appealing to the outcasts in a way. So we come up uh, with the research and with um, the analysis that allows us to basically target and address only, I would even say, the hypest, coolest uh, part of the target audience. And that usually that, that kind of is all grounded in data that stands because most of you are basically, um, especially if you have like, are working on or, or um, um, have a brand that is a little bit more expensive, you will end up most probably with people who are more affluent, who have more money, who are more, who are better dressed, who look a little bit maybe uh, cleaner and so on. But then the thing is that there is a lot of things that we are actually missing. So by focusing and kind of beautifying and almost spectacularizing our target audiences, we do need to build personas. Don't get me don't get me wrong. This is a huge, huge step that we have made forward by not only targeting. 20s to 45s so or 30s to 55s and male and female and so on but understanding what their interests are going trying to understand their mindset but we need to go a little bit beyond that as well because the spectacle as i said technology is driving the spectacle as soon as we received as soon as there were people meters that were available we were obsessed with demographics we need to target only male 20 to 35 we need to target only teenagers 13 to 18 we need to target only female who are upscale, who uh, have two children, and so on and so on. The thing is, what is really, really surprising, and this previous uh, example actually has shown, there are a lot of niches of audiences that use your brand in a way that you would ever, never anticipate. So the way that you set your brand agenda, the way that all your mission and vision is like, it does not necessarily need to mean that it is the same the way your target audience perceives it or the same, a certain target audience perceive it. So that means, what for me is very important to say is, with all the technology that we have nowadays, we need to make sure to understand when precise is simply too precise. So we have the opportunities to retarget, we have the opportunities to understand who our people are, who are visiting our website, who are buying our cars, who are buying our um, product. We can, uh, adapt the creatives to, if they like basketball, because we have learned from, from, their, um, from their behavioral analysis that they like basketball, we can offer them ads with basketball in. If they like uh, hockey, we can offer them ads with hockey in. But that is going to kind of driving us in a spiraling downwards, downwards, and closing us to the opportunities to the other audiences and to the other uh, interpretations and other, let's say, 
brand uh, relevance that we potentially might have not uh, even anticipated. So why am I saying this? We are coming now to the, to the bottom line or the thing that I wanted actually to, what Xavier actually asked, how can it be that we are talking about data and cultural relevance at the same time? So it, let's say, just for the provocation sake, what if we turn the things upside down? What if we started with the stories first and not with the audiences? Because nowadays, as you know, especially also with GDPR, uh, <laughs> rules that have been introduced and so on, it, it will be a tighter and tighter and more difficult to get the audiences to retarget them, to understand uh, what, they, what they all uh, stand about. And then there is the question, if, for example, on your website, a pieces of content really truly resonate and is being engaged with and the story resonates, do you really care if the, this is just for the provocation sake, I'm not talking about the performance advertising and, and the programmatic and so on, but do you really, in terms of stories that resonate, do you really care if they are read by a female who is 34 years old and has a really, really high income? Maybe eventually she will not buy your luxury brand, but the story for some reason is relevant to her. For the story for some reason resonates and maybe we can satisfy this hunger. And then we come to the data part of it. So as you most probably all know, journalism has suffered significantly from the, um, um, I would even say from relying on advertising metrics in making its content. So as we all know, we had huge, huge issues with um, fake news. We had huge issues with um, uh, clickbaits. And one of the reasons, or the key reason for that was because of course publishers were trying to get, because the only way that they were able to survive was advertising. Getting the banner on my website, getting the ad in my print title. So getting the ad on the website was happening if you would have a traffic, or not only if you would have a traffic, but if you would satisfy a certain metric that advertiser, advertisers were measuring. So most cases, those were clicks, click-through rates, view-through rates, and so on. So in the end, it became, it became almost completely irrelevant if what you say in your text or what you say in your content resonates or not. Because if you wanted to survive, you needed to have people click on your, click on your title, never mind whether they will read it or not, because that will get you the banner, that will get you the ad on your website. On the other side, that also then meant Okay, inventing the news, making, sh making sure that we are coming up with something that is really spectacular, that's something that is really, uh, that is going to draw these clicks. Yes, this is justifiable because it will get me the ad on my, on, on my website. So of course the journalists then re realized that in such a, such, a, uh, such a situation, they have the responsibility towards the audiences. With journalism, as you know, it is all about stories. It is about stories, about facts, it's about explaining the world we live in. It is about making sure that people understand and know uh, how to deal with the facts of life. So in the case if we are just, you know, putting them out there with a click, uh, uh, with the titles that are clickbaits or fake news, we are acting irresponsibly. Journalism is ex acting irresponsibly. That has been happening for quite some time. So then basically quite a lot of smart people come, came together and said, and realize that basically one of the key issues why this is happening is because the, the content and the success of the content, the success, success of the stories was being measured by advertising metrics. It's, the two simply do not go together. You cannot say that the metric that is measuring a display banner ad that just pops up is the same that can tell you whether a certain story or a certain video has really resonated and you have actually gone further to investigate it, gone further to, to interact with it. So that's why basically nowadays there is a whole set of tools, um, some a little bit more successful, some a bit less successful, but it are trying actually to evaluate and um, tell when the content is really engaged with. So not whether it has been clicked on, not whether it is the page has been open, but rather really is the engagement with content happening 
and not only that, and also anticipate what kind of topics are trending, what kind of topics are really driving the, um, um, driving the interaction, what kind of topics are really um, culturally relevant at this point of time and also will be relevant for the trending and will be relevant for the future. So by the definition of the Reuters Institute, about the editorial analytics, they basically they say that it is a set of tailored tools, but also the way the organization works and has a culture of, let's say, monitoring and research that supports both short-term and long-term data-informed decisions, decision-making in the newsroom and that evolve over time. Here are several words that are really important. First one, where actually editorial analytics differentiates from advertising is a little bit the long-term part. So the decision that the journalists are making and the editors are making it when they are making their content is no longer, okay, will I get this click? Will I get this impression? It is, will this topic be trending and relevant for the future? Will it address the issues that will be talked about tomorrow in a week in two weeks time that will create more stories, of course short term as well. Then another thing is data informed. So really I need a proof, I need a data that will demonstrate and show to me that the decisions that I'm making in driving those conversations are right. And another thing which is very, very important, it is that it needs to evolve over time. It needs to be constantly checked, constantly proved, constantly re uh, reinstituted again. And what actually is the thing that we, I would say, in our media world, and especially the media agency world, already do have, we do have an organization of cult and cultural data tracking and monitoring and, and similar, unlike journalists and unlike, um, let's say, publishers who didn't, you did, simply did not used to have that, and that's why Reuters interested, because they have, they have made the definition based from the editorial perspective rather than, of course, from the advertising perspective. But then the question is, from our perspective, if there is already new metrics in place that is able to evaluate the success of content from the editorial perspective, can we learn from that in advertising? Because as you know, with the ad blockers, with the, um, as I said, GDPR rules, uh, with the fact that people and audiences recognize advertising and tend to kind of more and more passively receive it, you will most probably have heard it already so many times that we need to go into the direction of the content marketing, we need to gain relevance, we need to uh, create content, use influencers, PR and so on and so on because advertising simply is going to be fully automatized, it is going to do its due diligence of delivering information, but the relevance is needed. Then the question is whether we can actually use the, the learnings that the um, publishers already have and journalism has already made in order to kind of identify how we can, how we build our own cultural conversations, how we build our own um, 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 content, cultural content. So just to give you one small example, is this is uh, one of, let's say, the most um, widespread uh, editorial uh, metrics, which is called CPI, Content, content Performance Indicator. Very, very innovative, but the important thing is that editorial metrics do not focus only on one thing. They do not focus on click, they do not focus only on the engagement, they do not fo focus only on like, comment and share. That is, editorial metrics are an aggregation of many different individual metrics, matrices, that are able to demonstrate how a piece of content really performs. So just to give you the comparison, so the, on the left side is an article that is about a celebrity getting married and uh, just like very, very happy event. On the right hand side is a very important political article. So as you can see, if we were to judge it by, uh, by advertising metrics, 200,000 articles read on the left hand side, 15,000 article reads on the right hand side. We would say, okay, this is where we wanna go. It also fits with our advertising policies of you know, being happy, supporting really um, like positive stories, <coughs> stories about um, people's happiness about um, um, important moments in life and so on and so on. But when you compare the actual interaction with the, with the, with the, with the content, the content on the left had only four seconds of attention time. It was basically clickbait because there was a title about the celebrity, you clicked and it was done. Whereas the content on the right hand side had 270 seconds of attention time in average. 
So all the 15,000 people that actually, almost all the 15,000 people that have landed on this article have actually taken the time to read through it, go through it, and then additionally also comment on it or uh, refer to it, or so basically go to an additional link from, from here. There are many more metrics involved here. This is just um, kind of showing how it works and how it demonstrates, and, uh, how, how it works and how it demonstrates that even the articles that do not necessarily have huge, huge, um, huge numbers behind them have relevance and have basically make an impact. This is this is a very good example because nowadays we are very, very often talking about influencers marketing. And I always get a little bit nervous when talking about influencers marketing because up to now, basically the way that we have measured the success of influencers and influencers was always based on vain metrics. How many followers they have on the, on the, on the social media, how many likes, how many comments. Honestly, guys, these are the, all the things that can be bought. You know, so, I mean, if you would like to be an influencer, the easiest thing would be just invest around about 50,000 euros in building your, kind of buying your follow followership, and then you will see in like six or seven months you will get it all back because people will just see that you have a huge number of followers and their brands will start, start addressing you. That is not what we want to do. That is not the store, that is not the kind of stories that we want to build because here, if you work with an influencer who has one million followers, you will most probably pay a lot of money for that, and there will be in their, I don't know, news feed, there will be one news about your brand or one news about your uh, innovation, but it will, it will just be swallowed by everything else. It is more about a fit, as I said, cultural relevance, finding the people who maybe have only 15,000 followers, but they, those followers are the ones who want to hear about what you have to say, for whom what you have to say is truly, truly relevant. So just to give a few examples, these are basically the three tools that do already exist um, and that do offer already kind of this editorial analytics that uh, can basically help also develop the, uh, that can help you evaluate how, for example, the stories on your websites are being consumed, how the stories that you are already telling about your brand are resonating. So one of them, the first one, and I think that actually my preferred one is the Content360. It's also, um, not only because these are also um, the, the guys I know, but precisely because they have developed the most robust uh, CPI, um, CPI metric. Then there is also Chartbeat, which is also a very, very good tool, simply because it offers a whole set of information on a very simple dashboard and parsley. So those are the three, let's say, the leading at the moment, uh, in the moment in the market that are being used predominantly by publishers to evaluate their their content. So just to conclude, uh, basically, in terms of cultural branding and where actually it fits together with data, is if we really go back and analyze and use the data that is being um, that is being relevant to content rather than to advertising, then it will be able to help us identify relevant topics, relevant stories, and trends. Why is this important? Because each and every one of these tools is actually able to kind of swarm through, um, through a piece of content and find the topics that have resonated the most, that find the topics that, for example, within your brand resonate for, uh, on your website or on your social media channel and so on, resonate the, mo the most with um, with the people who are visiting, uh, visiting, visiting your channel. And in the end, it is basically, it comes down, if we want to go this route and if we want to really find the topics um, where we want to say something, where we want to be actively pursuing uh, certain cultural issues, we need to ask ourselves the following questions. Number one, what my brand stands for. Number two, as we have seen, to whom does it really matter? So it is not whether I want it to be a lady 20 to 35 years old who looks really, really, who is really, really good looking. It is really understanding to whom what I have to say really matters. That what these people then stand for. So not only for like what your brand, uh, brand mission vision is, what are actually the topics that they do stand for, what are the things that are important to them, and then all this together, how can we make the difference? And that's basically prepared for today.